This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 57. Recorded on May 16th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Uh, it's been a while, yeah. isn't it? It's been a couple of weeks. It has. It has. It has. Some traveling, some other things. I, I think probably the weather is now beautiful out there, right? Of course. <laughs> it always is. <laughs> it always is. I, I was You're just... talking about San Diego. Yeah. And I, and I work for the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> That's right. It was just somewhere, Elio, and someone... Oh, Leslie Schiff. She was at Tufts for a while in your department. Yeah. Do you know that name? She's a vi- I remember. She's a virologist at the University of Minnesota. Mm. Also joining us today... Not from the medical university, but from Denver, Colorado, Michael Schmidt. Well, this is, it's almost afternoon here. It's its about 12.56, so uh, it's afternoon on the East Coast where I normally would be. So I'm getting ready to attend the general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology, and we have a meeting before the meeting. So that starts tomorrow at 8 a.m., so I had a Get here before the meeting, because you can. You know what they say: when you have time to spare, you travel by air. <laughs> <laughs> really? What's the alternative? There's nothing. Uh, right? Trains. One of one of the people coming to the committee meeting has a has a um, pathological fear of flying since he was in an mm. airplane that crashed, and uh, he survived. So he doesn't like planes, and he goes into a full blown panic attack. And last year. When he attended the GM in San Francisco, it was the first time he had flown in something like 12 years. And the only reason he didn't use the emergency exit to get out of the plane is because there was a nun sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> and she calmed him the whole way going to San Francisco. And going back, there were a whole bunch of folks going back to his home airport that walled him off so he couldn't, you know, like leap out the, the first time he had the urge. <laughs> so he swore blind and his, his wife agreed he could take the train. I can't imagine being in a, in a plane crash. I, I always think about that when I'm flying, but it'd be so scary, the falling sensation and the craziness, right? Oh, yeah. Must be terrible. And, and it's, it's really pretty spooky if, if you've ever had to go through it. And um, he had to go through it. And I... Over a couple of beers, he told me the story, and it's absolutely, it's a white-knuckle event, so I, c- I can appreciate it. Well, Elio and I will be joining you in the Mile High City in a couple of days. Well, safe travels. Yes, we will be very safe. Well, today we have two papers for everyone. Well, so we did last time, but they were copper papers. They were special. And um, the first one is going to be discussed by Elio. Go, go for it, Elio. Okay, the title of the paper is Nematode Trapping Fungi, Eavesdrop on Nematode Pheromones. Now, this has to do with fungi and with nematodes. So, let's start out with a little bit of basic biology, which I'm sure many listeners know much more about than than I do, but here it is. Nematodes are worm-like organisms. They used to be worms, now they're something else. That's because of taxonomy. They are among the most common and abundant and widespread things on Earth. Now, we don't often think about them that way. We think about a few pathogens like Ascaris, Filaria, or hookworms. Or we may think about C. elegans, Henorabdis elegans, which thanks to, what's his name? (laughs) Help me. Uh, The guy who... The guy in the UK, right? The guy in the UK who... uh, Well, the one I knew who worked on C. elegans was Tom Blumenthal at Indiana. Now we're thinking about... I I know you're thinking of somebody else. I was hoping that would stimulate neurons, but... (laughs) Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyhow... 
C. elegans is one of the great model organisms uh, for studying, especially for studying uh, multicellular organ, multicellular bees. So it is a tremendous uh, organism. Now the um, Sydney Brenner. There you go. The abundance go. of the nematodes is really it's really staggering. You can find as many as a million or more in one square meter of soil. You know, they live in soil. They live in waters. One square meter. The, no, you mean one square centimeter, right? No, it's one square meter, a square meter. But look, these things are not bacteria. I mean, they're microscopic. Worms are big. But they're, they're big. Uh, okay. You know, a million per square meter. A million meter. in a square meter. Is <laughs> a, I mean, they couldn't possibly fit in a square centimeter, no matter how deep it would be. Unless, you know, anyhow. There are lots and lots and lots of them. They will give you an idea. Uh, some nematodes lay 20 million eggs in their lifetime, and as many as... 200,000 a day. How long do they live? Well, it varies. Couple, they don't live, days. usually they don't live more than a few weeks. Yeah. I think that's it. Brenner, Sidney Brenner is who I was thinking of. The yep. great man who not only contributed hugely to microbial genetics, but then went on out of the clear blue to this, uh, invent C. rhabdis as, C. elegans as a, um, as a model organism. Anyhow. So they live in soil, and in soil, they are really, they live on various things. Many are herbivores, they live on plants. Some, maybe as many as a third or more of them, are bacterivores. They doesn't live on bacteria. In fact, if you want to grow sea elegance in the lab, on petri dishes, you feed them, feed them E. coli, you know, the bacteria, they mm -hmm. eat that. And then there are some which are fungivores. But... It turns out that there's also a um, tit for tat here. Namely, some fungi eat them. <laughs> How can a fungus, which is pretty small, eat a big nematode? And the answer is by, first of all, sticking to it. So some of the soil fungi have structures which are either gooey and therefore just simply adhere to the nematode, or one which is particularly elegant, they make a lasso-like structure. I mean a lasso. Mm. I mean three cells making a circle, a hollow circle, and this hollow circle attracts the nematode. And when the nematode, the poor nematode is inside of this, this has to do with chemotaxis, by the way, once it's inside of them, these cells of the fungus inflate and wow. They become a huge lasso, and the poor nematode can begin to escape. Now, either way, either by simple adherence or by lassoing, the fungi stick to the nematode, and they develop certain specialized cells called Austoria, H-A-U-S-T-O-R-I-A, which penetrate into the nematode and start eating it up. Mm -hmm. So they suck it dry, essentially. Okay, so that's the story. So there are beneficial fungi. The ben on the other hand, there are beneficial nematodes because some nematodes are parasites of bad things as well. So it's very complicated biology or varied biology. Now, uh, what's kind of remarkable about the nematodes is that most people, including me, not, not long ago, really are not conscious of the huge importance that they have in the world. Is that right? You, what, do you, what do you think? Am I right on that? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. You were an expert on nematodes all your life, probably. <laughs> not me. Not me. I, the only I, went to two, I went to too many seminars as a graduate student. <laughs> Anyhow, so the nematodes that trap, the fungi that trap nematodes have a way of recognizing that the nematodes are around and they are... It has to do with the following. Nematodes produce small molecules called ascarocytes, which regulate nematode development and behavior. You can think of them as being hormone-like, if you wish. Anyhow, ascarocytes are recognized by the fungi. So the fungi know that there are ascarocyte molecules around. Therefore, there are nematodes around. So I guess these are secreted by, by the worms, right? They're secreted by the worms, mm -hmm. that's right. So that's the short of the story. The lengthy part is that these ascarocytes are uh, dioxy sugars linked to a fatty acid side chain. Mm. 
And there are at least 100 different ascarocytes known, and they function, some function in synergy, some function in uh, overlapping activities, and many are quite specific to certain nematodes, and others are pretty broad. So there are pheromones, is actually a better word than a hormone. There are pheromones in that they induce um, uh, what is known as larval diapause, which is a stage in the development, both insect larvae and nematode larvae. So uh, they do that, and some are, as the word pheromone indicates, potent male attractants. So, Elia, so, what's the difference between a pheromone and a hormone? Do you know? I think a pheromone is something that's out in the environment. Is that yeah. A, if you, well, if, it's peculiar because, you know, the hormone is, is acting on the whole organism where the pheromone is probably acting at a specific aspect of the genetic programming of, you know, it's a cause and effect. If mm. the pheromone's present, it turns on a suite of genes uh, that may then solicit... Uh, hormones um, do that too. Come on. But they're su- I think, yeah. I think they're but, secreted, right? Outside. No, I think it's well, they are secreted, secreted, but you could almost make the argument about hormones too. Yeah, but these are outside the organism, right? We don't, we don't secrete testosterone, do we? I, I'm not secreting any testosterone. From your you cells that. they are, and they're <laughs> circulating through your body. But you're not sure. putting it into the dirt. Yeah. Anyhow, you're I mean, not putting it these guys dirt. are very, the scarocytes are exciting molecules. They do a lot of different things, and they're important for the development of the nematodes. The name scarocytes tells you that they were first found in Ascaris, which are huge worms present in huge amounts in the intestines of children in tropical parts of the world. Anyhow, the fun, they, so they studied this by using a fungus called Arthrobotrys. Uh, the, the many nemat, nematode-trapping fungi, they're really quite common. But one of them that they studied is one that makes networks that are gooey and sticky and to which the worms stick. So, and this is, uh, this fungus is a, a saprophyte. It exists in the soil and it's, it's quite common. Uh, it grows uh, perfectly well without the nematodes, but when it when it smells an nematode, as it were, it becomes predaceous. And what it does, it differentiates into these nematode trapping networks that I talked about and I mentioned. In other words, without the nematode, it doesn't make those structures. With the nematodes, it makes them, and therefore it becomes sticky, and when a nematode passes by, it is stuck. Hmm. Here it goes. It's gone. It's a goner after that. So, uh, let's see. There are a couple of points here that, that are worth making. Different ascarocytes act differently in this regard in being recognized by uh, fungi. And different fungi, in fact, are fairly picky. That is, some recognize certain kinds of these, uh, pheromones and others recognize other kinds. Again, this is sort of a theme in the world of nematodes. Is everybody is sort of different from everybody else. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, you add uh, the ascarocytes to a culture uh, of fungi, and you find the production of these, uh, these uh, trapping structures. Uh, this is suppressed if the medium is rich. In other words, if you add a nitrogen source to the medium, the fungi won't do that, even with ascarocytes there, we- meaning that they only do this when they have to. They don't make uh, complicated structures which are expensive to make unless they're really needing uh, nitrogen compounds for the nutrition. But if you supply them with nitrogen compounds, that's that's it. Hmm. That's, that's all they do. They don't go any further and they don't they don't bother. So um, there is uh, this is a short paper and I won't I won't uh, try to squeeze it dry. This is pretty much. The story, it looks like there is some pattern here, although there's not enough studies to say this. Namely, some fungi which make different kinds of trapping mechanisms do not respond to the ascarocytes, whereas others do. So it's um, it's a story of typical biology out there. Somebody makes a useful compound to themselves. A predator recognizes it, knows it's there. Now... Um, this is the story. Predators and preys are complicated be- entities. They don't uh, 
uh, respond in simple ways, and there is always a danger that if you let your presence known by talking to your buddies, <laughs> somebody else is going to listen in on the conversation. So this is the f this is the food chain. The, the worms eat the bacteria, and then the fungi eat the worms. Right? Who eats the fungi? Uh, Ailey, are there other predators of fungi? My goodness, that's a good question. Um, that yeah. would be humans. We yeah. eat plenty of fungi. We eat plenty of fungi. Um, yeah. I'm sure that I'll, I'll I'll think about it and let you know when I. So is this something that, that nematodes would um, want to regulate? Is, is it a threat to their existence? Is it a selective force such that there might be mechanisms to regulate this, to, to sort of dupe the... Uh, yeah, but fungi? you see, I'm not sure how, how this really works because the number of nematodes that get eaten at any one time is not that great. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, so I don't know that this is... It's not like you kill, you know, most bacteria with an antibiotic and the few yeah. that survive, survive. Right. I mean, this is not, it's not that strong a selective pressure. These are just them. crumbs, <laughs> crumbs on the plate. I guess. <laughs> it's pretty but neat. But it is important. I mean, it's not, um, it's not a trivial phenomenon. And I think it does probably, I don't think anybody knows, but I would put good money that it does regulate the density of uh, nematodes in, in the soil. Mm-hmm. You know, so in other words, it's probably good. It's probably a good thing, right? It's probably a good thing, except that some nematodes are good themselves. Yeah, some yeah. are. Uh, uh, you know, they 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 attack certain pre certain other predators. So, so, so would this be uh, any of of any use to design ways to um, get rid of get rid of the nematodes in your intestine? Ah, uh, gosh. You know, maybe you purify some of these. These molecules that uh, the um, the fungi oh. use, you know, who knows? Uh, let me tell you what the snag may be. Uh, most fungi, certainly soil fungi, don't like high temperatures. Uh, so they're not going right. to love sitting in your intestine mm -hmm. waiting for a nematode to, to eat. Uh, that, is, that alone is would be a problem. But also I think you would have to have a... A fungus that really, for any reason, any other reason as well, enjoys living in the intestine. There are very few. These are all filamentous fungi. They're not yeast. Yeah, yeah. We have fungi in our intestines, though, right? Yeast. Oh, yeast, yeah. Uh, the main yeast. Yeasts. Yeah, they're not filamentous. I'm not aware of filamentous fungi living in the intestine, although I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> that there must be some. But not a common thing. Hmm, it's a cool story. Yeah. Well, you might think of it in some other way. I don't know. But it's 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 a complicated mechanism. This building, this specialized structures of yeah. the fungus that can penetrate. And it's neat. Well, one of the things the authors brought up in their narrative is they pointed out to the reader that um, bacterial molecules like peptidoglycan, mm -hmm. uh, when found in human serum, can actually activate a fungus, Canada alpagans, to move from the yeast phase to the hyphal stage. And the infectious disease community views that once Canada albicans transforms from yeast to hyphal stage, it's it's considered to then be you know in its uh, virulent form. It, yeah. You know, once it it develops that hyphal mechanism, it's 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 uh, thought to be a, a significant pathogen rather than you know just carrying on. Mm. Well, that's true, and it is interesting, but I don't think it's particularly relevant. It's simply another case where pheromone-like activities are found. In other words, the peptidoglycan acts like a signal, and that's true. But I, I, <laughs> I gotta tell you, I think they padded they padded the discussion a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't Wait. a point that was very short uh, paper. But is this an active field? There are not, probably not many people doing this sort of thing. Right? Well, you know, uh, it's National Geographic active. I mean, you see movies occasionally of uh, nematode trapping fungi because they're very dramatic. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I well, no, that's I, I should say that in soil in soil biology, this is an active field of study. Yes, there are, there's quite a bit of work on this. Well, this is something new. I did not know this, so. Thanks for pointing that out. And uh, that's pretty neat. Short paper, Current Biology, January 2013. Thank you, Alio. Sure. 
Uh, the uh, the second paper is one that I heard about during a talk by someone whose name is escaping me at the moment. We're in the escaping of names business today, aren't yeah. we? It's early. The coffee hasn't <laughs> kicked in. Um, you guys would know this fellow. He's a microbiome person from, person from MIT. His name is Eric Alm, A-L-M. Do you know that name? Uh, not really. All right, so he's going to be publishing soon that paper that will be pretty cool. Anyway, he mentioned this paper, and I was in the audience, and I looked it up, and it was very cool. He was showing a slide of a young lady eating a piece of sushi when he brought this up. And so I said, this has to be a paper for TWIM. It's a PNAS paper, and the title is Bacteria of the Human Gut Microbiome Catabolize Red Seaweed Glycans with Carbohydrate Active Enzyme Updates from Extrinsic Microbes. And this is by Heyman, Kelly, Pudlow, Martins, and Borastin. So this, I was just totally taken by this, and it's mainly because I don't know any of this. Here's the thing that I get. So most of the bacteria in our gut, these, these firmicutes and bacteroidetes, they degrade polysaccharides. So when you eat a plant or some other material with long uh, sugars, complex sugars, it gets degraded by our microbiome. And by sequencing the microbiome of our gut, you can find, by looking at the sequences, enzymes that are used, theoretically, for the bacteria to digest things like starch and pectin and hemicelluloses and other other glycans, which are basically polysaccharides. Okay, so these guys help us to digest all this stuff, which we can't digest themselves. And in fact, there is a website called the uh, the CASI database. It's at c a z y dot org, and there you can find the families of all these structurally related carbohydrate enzymes. The carbohydrate enzymes that degrade or modify uh, glycosidic bonds. So if you're really into this, you can go check that out. They're called Cazymes, C-A-Z-Y-M-E-S. Mm-hmm. And you guys must know all about this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael's the guy who knows everything. I'm not. <laughs> yes, I, don't know. I wasn't kidding. This is the old-time religion story that we used to do in um, the advanced microcurriculum for undergraduates. We would ask them to pick novel carbohydrates, yeah. and we would send them out to the dirt, and they would get uh, samples of soil, right. and then they would design various media where the they would have one particular carbon source. And I think you're going to probably go go into the unique aspect of how they got at things. So I won't spoil your 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 show, but you know it's it's the classic. Can you please grow on pick your favorite compound? Right. And because good garden soil has, you know, a very complex microbiome of about 10,000 species per gram of, of soil. And um, I think the true trick to this paper, as, as folks read it, is to appreciate that these are anaerobic microbes. And... It's really challenging to work with bacteroides as a group because they're so sensitive to molecular oxygen. So traditional culture technologies don't work. You really need a, a good anaerobic chamber in order to, to carry out these things. And if I had a quibble with the authors here, they really didn't tell us how they grew the stuff. They, they sent you on the scavenger hunt of this paper beget that paper, that mm-hmm. beget that paper to figure out how they do it because it's really neat of going after a unique carbon source. And, and that's, I think, Vincent, why you found this so fascinating because of the sushi connection. So yeah. I'll set up and let yeah. you go. It was the sushi connection for sure, which will be clear in a moment. All right. So the question they're addressing in this paper is how do members of our gut microbiome evolve to process new carbohydrates? So humans didn't always eat sushi you know, they ate plants and then they ate meat. And now more recently they started eating seaweed, I guess. I don't know how recently. So how do you get these enzymes in there? So they, they study the bacteroidae members in this paper. And in these uh, bacteria, the genes for digesting polysaccharides are, are clustered in what they call polysaccharide utilization loci or PULs, PULs, to uh, 
to use an acronym to keep Michael happy. <laughs> and uh, the gene products of this locus uh, sense, they sense carbohydrates in the gut lumen, they degrade them, and then they import the degraded products into the bacterial, into the bacteria for their further use. So they use Bacteroides plebeius, wonder, wonderful name, plebeius. Isn't that great? Mm. <laughs> they, they have great names. The, the <laughs> microbes they were working with have these great names. Yeah, and so they found a pull, a P-U-L, containing enzymes that they say are probably acquired by horizontal gene transfer from marine microbes, and they think this helps us to digest uh, the carbohydrates from red seaweeds. So red algae are, is, is the most common dietary red seaweed uh, polysaccharide that we, that we eat, and you can find this in processed foods, in like carrageenans and agars and porphyrin. All these are from different kinds of red algae, and we eat these a lot. And these are complicated polysaccharides. They have sulfate groups, sulfate esters, that are not present in terrestrial plants. So they're quite unique. Make sure that you make a distinction here. Uh, although in, uh, in some parts of the world, algae are eaten as such, yeah. when you say that uh, what you just said refers to compounds purified from the algae. Right. We don't, we, you know, worldwide, we don't, the consumption of algae is high, but not, in, not immense, and certainly quite low in Europe. In the Western world, it's very low. Right, so there are these purified algal products that are used in other right. foods, right? The carrageenans and the agars and so forth. But people also eat um, sure. other kinds of uh, algae as well. Uh, the average American probably gets most of the carrageenan in their diet from eating ice cream. Yeah, because right. it that's it right. gives the texture uh, and the mouthfeel to to ice cream and actually stabilizes it to prevent it from getting those nasty ice crystals. Hmm. And it increases the shelf life of, right. of the ice cream. So the enzymes to break down these compounds, car car how do you say, carrageenan or genin? Genin is the way I was taught, but I'm not the most you know, ardent pronouncer. <laughs> anyway, the enzymes to break these down are typically found in marine microbes, not in bacteria that typically break down terrestrial uh, polysaccharides. So, if you look at the if you look at the sequences of the gut microbiomes that have been published, you can find sequences encoding enzymes that would break down these red algae polysaccharides in the microbiomes of Japanese and Spanish and Americans. Okay. And that suggests that they have acquired the ability to uh, to digest these novel carbohydrates. And in this paper, they want to do some functional studies and say, we want to go beyond the microbiome, beyond showing a sequence. We want to show that these enzymes are actually working. So what they do first is they show that they, they work with a few culturable uh, bacteria, B. plebeius isolates, and they show that they can grow on uh, certain substrates like seaweed carbohydrates, uh, and that each one is specific for a type of galactan, like agarose or porphyrin or carrageenan, all right? So they have these bacteria which will grow on minimal medium containing one or, or the other of these uh, galactans. Uh, then they show that in, in one of these bacteria, B. plebeius, there is a 40-gene member, P-U-L, um, which... It encodes the enzymes that can break down these glycans. They show when you add porphyrin to the bacteria, it transcriptionally activates them. It upregulates the amount of uh, RNA that is being produced. Although they also find that some members of this pool locus are actually always produced, and they think that this is so the bacteria can actually sense the presence of, of the complex glycans uh, and then begin degradation of them and then further induce uh, the enzymes when, when the products are there. Do you think... Uh, mm. This question is directed to both of you. Do you think this is sort of why the lac operon always weeps a few molecules of permease and a few molecules of beta-galactosidase just to um, be ready in case it encounters milk sugar? Mm. And the lac operon is because he, when it's in E. coli uh, growing in a very um, eutrophic niche, uh, like the human gut, where there's a lot of opportunity for milk sugars like lactose, it may have evolved a more sophisticated regulatory system where we understand all the catabolite control, whereas what we're seeing with these 
new carbohydrates that are being transiently introduced, the gut flora is sort of making an option play yeah. of deciding whether or not they're going to keep it by, you know, investing the energy into having enough of these enzymes around in case the opportunity presents itself saying, well, will the dumb human eat something that we can potentially use? Yeah. Uh, sounds good to me. What do you think, Alio? Uh, sure. It's possible. <laughs> sure. I think it's, con I think I'm thinking of interferons in human, in, in mammals. There's always a low uh -huh. level of low level of interferons produced so that they can respond very quickly when there's a pathogen present. So I think many systems may display that kind of, uh, behavior surveillance you know that's what they call it in yeah. this paper yeah so the the this inducible pul in b plebeius is contained when they look at the sequence within what's called an ice ice an integrating conjugative element and this contains genes for mobilizing it and recombination in other words they think this shows that this this locus this pull encoding these genes that can break down these complex glycans arrives by uh, horizontal gene transfer there, right in the middle of direct repeat sequences that they think can probably mediate clean excision uh, of the pull. So that's pretty neat. Now, there are four putative agarases and porphyrid, porphyrinases in the pull of B. plebeius. They took each one of these and they expressed them in E. coli to study their activities and, and confirm their specificities. And they find, for example, that uh, the agarase and the porphyrinase together degrade porphyrin. And they can show this very specifically by you know, expressing the proteins individually and in combination. So here we have the evidence that these enzymes actually encode, sorry, that these genes actually encode enzymes that degrade uh, these glycans. Uh, and the last bit of the paper they do which is a lot of work, they determined the crystal structure of two of the porphyrinases uh, encoded in this B. plebeius PUL. And they can see the active site, and they can say that it's typical of glycoside hydrolases, in other words, enzymes that break down glycans. And one of the structures actually had a oligosaccharide bound uh, into the active site of the enzyme. So the structure is completely consistent with an enzyme that is breaking down um, Glycan. So here you have uh, enzyme, enzyme activity biochemical assays, which show that, uh, well, they showed, of course, the bacteria grow on the right substrates. They have enzymes that can break them down, and the crystal structure shows it's the right enzyme. Uh, you're right, by the way. This is a, a sort of nice comprehensive study. Uh, I was actually, um, I, I admire the sophistication on, on all levels especially the structural stuff. So they must work with some really to... Must, this is a consortium effort of yeah. Several, yeah. several groups, and they must have had some really great microbiologists and some terrific X-ray crystallographers. Yeah. So I'm, uh, it's really impressive in that sense. But that's probably the way it's going to be from now on, isn't it? I'm I not think saying so. anything, yeah. anything unexpected. This no, is uh, simply that I wasn't quite ready for the widespread acceptance or usage of such sophisticated techniques. Yeah, I think that going forward, you have to collaborate. 1.3, my angstrom resolution, isn't that it's very good. amazing? That's pretty incredible. Yep. And, you know, if, you've, if you're a follower of Elio's blog, you'll see that Stan Falco had a recent post about fecal transplants, and he has this great image of empty gelatin capsules ready for filling. Mm. And so if you think about it, if you, you, you imagine how, if you, how you begin to think about moving these metabolic capabilities from place to place, the gelatin capsule that, that Stanley talks about in his stool transplant piece is really a metaphor of, of what the bacteria are actually doing. <laughs> We're probably bringing the bacteria in on the sushi seaweed yeah. and they're protected in a, a very uh, tight anaerobic niche and we ingest them and just like the capsules that Stanley was was asked to uh, fill <laughs> uh, we actually bring in the metabolic potential it's almost like 
And the other thing, um, I was once having breakfast with Dr. Falco at, at a Gordon conference, and he was expounding on how you find new, exciting genetic things. And he was talking about insertion sequence elements. And, uh, you know, it was in the early days of the emergence of the pathogenicity island uh, material. And, and what these authors allude to in one of the uh, elements that they were studying, it actually inserts itself around a lesser used tRNA gene. And we know that that's how pathogenicity islands move themselves about. They look for a less frequently used tRNA gene in which they can sneak, you know, the, the freight train of, you know, these 40 genes into the genome of the microbe without any fuss or muss and, uh, you know, provide this metabolic potential to the host. So... You know, they, they real, uh, I give them a tremendous amount of credit for taking it down to the, you know, the angstrom level in really teaching us how to, to reconstruct a cause and effect paper from, from the microbiome. And I think we're going to see many more of these cause and effect uh, papers as, as the microbiome uh, becomes more common or using the microbiome becomes more common in our micro and biochemistry laboratories around the world. So when do you think uh, these, these genes came from seaweed? Do, you have, do we have any sense of how long ago? It, it could be something as, you know, it's, you know, the Japanese have been probably using seaweed for a very long period of time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's more for an anthropologist to probably address. We can probably look at genetic drift of some of these genes that may come out of um, populations of, yeah, right. of the Japanese, because we know Helicobacter uh, is subjected to genetic drift, and there were those great studies that showed how Helicobacter moved from the Fertile Crescent across uh, Asia Minor, across Asia, over the land bridge into the Americas, and all the way down to the tip of Chile. Yep. And... You know, so I think some of those same techniques could address that question of, you know, when did they arrive? Really interesting to know because humans or pre-humans were first plant eaters, right? Yeah. And I don't know how far back, but not Homo sapiens, but the precursors were at some point plant eaters. And then, you know, we became meat eaters, I, I understand, and that helped us to uh, diversify successfully. But um, the seaweed came in. Who knows when? Well, the one thing I, I was wondering about as I was reading it, is there such a thing as a vegetarian fish, a fish that only eats vegetable matter? And could well, then... Sure, in the reef, uh, fish eat uh, mainly algae, mm -hmm. nibble the algae that are growing on the, on the, uh, on the atoll, on the, on the surface. So, so then yeah. we may have recovered the microbes from the fish hmm. as we ate the entire fish or, you know, a little minnow and, you know, as we ate it, sure. we may have acquired the microbes and then, you know, natural sure. selection made the decision as to whether or not we would keep it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Good point. Interesting stuff. Anyway, I thought that was a cool paper and uh, people would enjoy it. So that's basically it. Anything I missed, Michael? Nope. It has everything in it from growth curves to PCR to uh, the, you know, asking people to remember what a reducing sugar is and re relearn <laughs> the Benedict's reaction. That's right. And crystal uh, structures. Vic, uh, Vincent, you're going to talk about this, uh, the end of the discussion, um, the business of health implications of this. Kind of, I thought that was kind of interesting. Yes. Uh, if you remember, what they say ahead, is that. Ahead. Um, the polysaccharides, some of these polysaccharides are uh, supposed to be very good. In other words, they claim that they're antiviral, anti-cancer, ah, yes, yes, anti-inflammatory, yes. and actually people go around saying polysaccharides, polysaccharides. It's going to save my life. But whether that's the extent to which that's true is probably highly debatable. But let's say it is. What happens is when you break them down, the molecules that are broken down from the low, low molecular weight degradation products of carrageenan right. uh, induce ulcerative colitis in animal models. Mm. 
Right. Mamma mia, that's not good. Yes. So, no. uh, you know, you don't want this bacteria to do this breaking down of stuff because they could be causing something very bad. So, I don't know, it comes at the price, yeah. it sounds like. It is interesting, yeah. And, and the ulcerative colitis statement is is pretty scary because it's a, a really slippery so, slope. Once it's triggered, it's very challenging to reverse the effects of the ulcerative ulcerative colitis and if it proceeds all the way into Crohn's I don't then... know. have you have you read read those papers Mike I haven't so I don't know I have not just how much how much stock I put into it I went to hunt them up to, to see what was actually going on but I didn't get very far yeah it uh, I would say let's let's take that with a grain of salt yeah, one of them is rapid production of ulcerative disease in the colon in newly weaned guinea pigs by degraded carrageenan. Mm. Okay. You know, so that's an interesting point, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Elio, did you want to leave us? You had to go. Yeah, with- I'm sorry. I have to say goodbye. So no problem. I'll see you guys in Denver. We will. Have a good trip. Very soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. Michael. Yes. We have a few follow-ups from our copper episode that I thought you would love to answer. (laughs) Uh, The first one is from Wink. Wink is an infectious disease follower of, he's an MD and he's a follower of TWIM. Great HI work. I'm not through it yet. I want to question though whether fomites are really important in influenza transmission. I don't think so. I guess we talked about viruses in copper, right, Michael? Yeah, viruses... You know, copper takes a while to kill because they're not growing, so it's probably you have to take the virus apart. And those papers um, are have been in the literature for a while. It was um, influenza, and I've heard um, that uh, other folks are looking at other viruses for inactivations. But influenza and fomites, um, you know, it's, it's an issue about particle size and, and what you pick up. And um, when you sneeze, you make the particles in the Goldilocks size, and they, they settle. And the question is how you, you pick them up. And inhalation is principally how they think most of us get influenza. But, you know, you can actually pick it up and, you know, inoculate yourself. You're the virologist, so you would know better than I how many of the the viruses are are transmitted via fomites, and this is certainly the case with norovirus. Norovirus, absolutely. we know, yeah, for sure. is absolutely transmitted by fomites. Yeah, and so I guess influenza is a little bit bigger than noro, and so I just don't know enough about viral transmission to to know. Oh, there's quite a all- there's quite a literature on flu transmission in surfaces. I mean, the virus will last for a while, on a few days on surfaces, um, mm-hmm. and they have shown in animal models that it can transmit by fomites. Yeah. And I also believe there's some epidemiology which which suggests such transmission in humans. There is a, there is a big literature, Wink, and maybe Wink is off looking at it and he'll get back to us. But yeah, I think, you know, we for flu, the, the major component is clearly respiratory droplet transmission, but I, I do think... Uh, fomites play a role as well. There's a lot, lot suggesting that it might. Yeah, the U- U.S. EPA has published um, a white paper on um, particle transmission and, and disease that I looked at a few years ago, and it, it's absolutely fascinating. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it's it's a it's a big literature that it's it's out there, and we just have to, I guess, revisit it every so often to reacquaint right. ourselves with right. it. Right. Right. All right, the next one is from Bernadetta, who writes, I'm a second-year microbiology undergraduate, and I very much enjoy all of your podcasts. They are a great pleasure to listen to, and I wait for the new ones every week. Since the last episode was all about copper, I thought it would be appropriate to point out this paper published in Nature in 1984, Why Whip Egg Whites in Copper Bowls? Who would have thought that a paper about copper bowls and cooking could have been published in Nature? (laughs) <laughs> now, I mean, remember every scientist eats <laughs> and uh, I, I I don't know that paper in nature about copper bowls and and egg whites but 
uh, having worked in a bakery, I do know about egg whites and copper bowls. And you would be hit by the head baker if you, you know, put it put the egg whites into a greasy bowl. So I think yeah. it has to do the whole issue of egg whites. I think is all about foam and stick because an egg yeah. beaten egg white is a stabilized foam. And I learned very early on when I did my first runs with fermenters that foam is the curse of the, of the microbiologist. And the way to prevent foam in your reactors is to and, and this was during days when you could go up to women and ask them, could you borrow their lipstick to put a little bit on the edge of the glass? And the the grease in the lipstick would actually collapse the foam. So my guess is the copper somehow helps to stabilize the foam, and it's probably interacting with a, mm. you know, one of the egg white proteins. It, yeah. it's they say here that um, it's ba- yeah, you're absolutely right. It's to prevent overbeating. The foam, because you don't want ah, to, so it keeps it. Because pre- then it will collapse. Yeah, and, gets- and they say copper may react with the sulfhydryl groups in albumin to perform mercaptides and so interfere with disulfide crosslinking, which seems to oh. be involved in the production of egg albumin foams. Okay. That interesting. So this doesn't have anything to do with microbes. It has to do with cooking and foam, but uh, it's still interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, Bernadette continues, I also think that this paper could be shortly discussed on one of the podcasts. Traditional mutational study, but seems quite prospective. What do you think? Identification of Salmonella pathogenicity island type 3 secretion system effectors involved in intramacrophage replication of S. enterica. Implications for rational vaccine design. And this is um, in MBIO. Well, maybe we should discuss this as our, our next when we do the next yeah. twin paper. We could do that as long as it passes the ALEO test, right? <laughs> yeah. As as long as it passes his his muster. Uh I know Roy Curtis is 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 the um you know strong proponent of developing rational vaccines for for Salmonella. So it'd be nice to to get his take on it or he may yeah. be an author yep. on this. All right. The next letter is from Frank, who writes, Bravo, Michael. I formerly developed an oxygen radical, not ozone, surgical instrument sterilizer, so have dealt with the difficulties of disinfection in HSAs, successfully sold it to Stryker Instruments. Wow. You you mentioned the problem of economically obtaining copper hardware due to the pervasive use of plastic. If you think about our common household plumbing fixtures, it is clear that plastic can be plated with many metals and shipped around the world by air. Plastic plumbing fixtures are typically plated with electroless copper, followed by nickel, then chromium. Air shipment is not an issue, so your former plating vendor simply did not have the technique or knowledge to give you a sturdy, uncontaminated injection molded part. I was involved in the development of many of these processes in the 70s. Roman Haas is still a major supplier of plating solutions and methods. Similarly, any metal part can be easily plated in whole or in part with copper or copper alloys by the OEM, original equipment manufacturer. A quick swipe with ammonia will remove finger oils, which could allow bacterial film growth and will expose fresh copper surface. Despite, cool. all, this, despite all this antimicrobial furor, I look forward to the omics studies identifying how many HSAs are from the environment versus the patient. Microbiome studies seem to be showing that microbial diversity balance rather than eradication is often the key mechanism of maintaining health. Thanks to all of you Twiv, Twip, and Twimmers for creating and maintaining one of the most educational, accessible, and plain old fun scientific forums ever. Well, thank you. I mean, he, he's absolutely spot on. Um, you know, one of the challenges we had doing our study is um, trying to you know, I'm I'm not a manufacturer. I don't have a- access to manufacturing techniques. Uh, you know, most modern um, universities today no longer even have um, glassware shops that can blow yeah. complex glass shapes. Um, you know, they, unfortunately, they were valued engineered out uh, long ago. And I think there's only a few chemistry departments left that have the master glass blower. Yeah. And so we we were really challenged trying to find folks um to help us do this and um so that's why you go out and talk about it and tell all your 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 um challenges because you know people like frank 
come up and and tell you how it's done. And yep. after all, that's what science is all about: the full disclosure of all your data. And you have a common discourse, and you discuss what works, what's best. And and I think he's 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 on about balance, because the whole issue of pathogenicity is when one microbe gets out of control, and that's certainly the case with MRSA. Is MRSA gets a foothold, and it will typically infect a joint. And you know the hallmark of staph, specifically Staph aureus, is it causes osteomyelitis and lives inside the bone. And as anybody who's ever tried to administer antibiotics, you know about you know tissue penetrance and mm -hmm. delivering the proper concentration of drug under the curve for the period of time in which it's going to achieve an MIC. And these are the challenges of anti-infectives. And so the omics, if, if we can figure out the right balance, and I think that's where we go next in the basic science is we really need to figure out the ideal microbiome of the built environment. Yep. You know, do we want to overwhelm it with good coag negative staph or do we want to make it as clean as possible or do we just want to do something as simple as keep the burden under 5,000 colony forming units on bed rails or you know, you pick your favorite object and you set a target and then you do the cause and effect. So, right, right. you know, F Frank's absolutely spot on with his with his uh, perception of of how to begin to to tease this apart. Unfortunately, you know, it, it's not sexy. It's not crystallography. It's just plain hard work and getting the funding agencies interested and in just doing plain hard work when they're really trying to push the envelope like the PNAS paper that we just talked about with sub you know the angstrom resolution of a crystal structure to really be begin to understand yeah. the predator prey processes because the bacteria are literally going after the same carbon source and you're setting up a dynamic equilibrium and the microbe that has the best enzyme that can process the substrate in these case in the case of that paper it was the porphyrins or the agaroses um, to to really um, degrade it. Yeah, really will drive the system, and it'll teach us an awful lot, you know, just by asking simple questions. Our next one is from Jim, who writes: I was amazed to see note thirteen in the caption for this article out of the April May twenty thirteen AARP magazine about the use of copper alloys on frequently touched surfaces. So he sent the PDF of the page. Okay. It's a picture of, uh, it's called a safe hospital room of the future. It's kind of an aerial view with different numbers on different things. And number 13 is frequently touched surfaces such as IV poles, bed rails, and faucets are made with germ resistant copper alloys, which are naturally antimicrobial. Interesting. Wow. How about that? Huh? You, can you see that uh, graphic there? I, I, I can see that graphic. It, it's absolutely incredible. It's and cool. um, we should ask, <laughs> We should see if Ray can shamelessly post it on, on, on the website for us because this will give the listeners an overview of truly how complicated the typical hot modern hospital room is today and how many surfaces yeah. there are. And the only criticism I have of the graphic image mm -hmm. is it doesn't have the grab bars that all modern – hospital rooms are having to help the patient ambulate from the bed yeah. to the toilet. Right. And typically it, there's um overhead guide that they grab on and they take themselves to the toilet. Cool. So Neat. thanks. Great image. That. Yeah, it's cool. And the last one's from Lori who says, I love your show, especially the recent episode about the use of copper in hospitals. I'm a nursing student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I'm always cleaning patient bed rails and call lights. <laughs> patient, patient hands are not the only thing that comes in contact with the bed rails. The rail is also frequently used by nurses to temporarily hang pieces of tape while inserting an IV or changing a dressing. The tape with all its germs attached is removed from the bed rail and taped onto the patient's skin in close proximity to an open wound. Wow. Ooh. 
A future study might include the pathogens transmitted by stethoscopes. People are pretty good about washing their hands, but I never see anyone cleaning their stethoscope. It is my very unscientific, empiric observation that the stethoscope is one of the biggest fomites in any hospital. I have seen copper writing pens for sale, but I am not aware of anyone who makes a copper-coated stethoscope. Another possible fomite is employee badges. They come in contact with our patients when we lean over them. I stuff mine in my pocket so it does not contact the patient. Well, the Joint Commission requires that your badge be prominently displayed so as someone's walking down the hall, they can not only see your face, but they can read your name. So it has to be at eye level. And oftentimes the ID badge is an electronic key, so they're on these pull strings. Hmm. What some places are experimenting with is... RFIDs that they um, will place in your pocket rather than, you know, your badge will no longer be a key and the RFID will be implanted in your uniform and that way you can get into secure areas and, you know, right. doors will automatically open. And, right. and so the, the whole issue of fomites is a substantial issue for the Joint Commission, which is the entity that along with the Centers for Disease Control and every hospital's infection control committee that sets policy mm -hmm. for, for these things. And many hospitals have policies, uh, and it's recommended that the stethoscope be clean between each patient use. But the kinetic nature of care being what it is, the good people taking care of our ill um, sometimes forget, or it may not be readily accessible and 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 so um, some people use tricks like they get an extra glove and they put that over the stethoscope, but that mm. diminishes the sound transmission. Mm. Uh, but I think we'll probably see copper stethoscopes in, in the near future because the metal is, you know, the sound conductivity properties are no different than yeah. stainless steel. And there's some companies out there that make um, these beautiful uh, copper beryllium uh, diaphragms mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, polypropylene or polyvinyl that are used to transmit the sound. So mm -hmm. um, they'll, that'll probably be a study that needs evaluation as well. All right, everybody. Thanks for your letters. And uh, that will do it for TWIM57. You can find the TWIM at iTunes and at microworld.org slash TWIM. And if you like what we do, you can help us by going on over to iTunes and rating the show in the podcast directory. That keeps us visible. And as always, send us your questions and comments to twim at twiv.tv. Uh, Elio Schechter, who has left us, is at Small Things Considered. And, of course, we thank him for joining us. Michael Schmidt is usually at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. Always a pleasure. And it's, I'm very happy that you were able to rush to your hotel room and hook up just in time. Thank you so much. I was faster than the subway. Yeah, my subway. I, I was teaching over on the east side of Manhattan, and it took me almost an hour to get here. Spent a lot of time waiting on the platforms. Oh, well, they're not meant for me, I guess. <laughs> Many thanks to ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, for supporting TWIM, in particular Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega, for all their technical help. The music that you hear at the beginning and end of TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.